Yes, so the adventures in Chris's life meets scripture this week. Um, I was in a house with 17 people. I'm a total introvert. I know it seems weird that I would be a pastor and hang out with everybody, but I'm kind of a, a strong introvert. So me trapped in a house with 17 people uh, made for some interesting moments where I, I wanted to retreat and like go hide in my room, and I often would. Um, and yet at the same time, I could overhear the, the great fun that was being had by my brothers and their kids and their spouses. And it was, it was, it was hard to make choices in the midst of it. It was, it was priorities time. Um, and thankfully, I decided to dive into a parable that actually has some stuff to say about priorities. Um, I did the prodigal son before, like as my first one in the series, and then I did the Good Samaritan. Both pretty common parables, once we've heard a few times and are, are fairly um, simple to dive into. And then um, this time I said, well, there's this one parable that nobody ever preaches on. I should get into that one. It, it looks a little more challenging and, and harder. Um, anybody like to do things the hard way? I was reminded this week my mom always tells me I have to do things the hardest way possible. Um, so... I decided to do a hard one. All right, so uh, it's in Luke chapter 16. Jesus, um, it's right following the prodigal son. Jesus is um, explaining, he has a chapter that he that captures his teachings on money. And he tells this very, very interesting story. And, and we're going to get into it today. Um, all right. Luke 16, um, it's 1 through 9. It's the parable of the shrewd manager. Sometimes it's titled the parable of the dishonest manager. So, here's what it says. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. Possessions, And so he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. So that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. And so he called each one of his master's debtors. And he asked the first one, How much do I owe my master? How much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. And the manager told him, Take your bill. Sit down quickly. Make it 400. And then he asked the second one, How much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. And he told him, take your bill and make it 800. And the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people in this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Let's pray. God, we love you. Um, you are amazing. You, you came and gave your life for us, um, and in doing so, canceled our debt to you. Um, and you welcomed a way for us to be with you in eternal places, and, and now we give um, this hour to you, this, these next 15 minutes, and Lord, I might just pray that you would plant something in our lives that uh, we could use this week to bring a smile to your face. You're so good to us. Meet us here now. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Um, in that parable, uh, those amounts in there, I'm, I'm going to bring this up a little bit later, but it said that there were, uh, that it was like 800 um, gallons of oil, and that was the equivalent of 500 denarii, and in, um, in the Roman world, the denarii was a really cool coin because it was one day's wage. You work, you get a coin. And uh, so 500 is about a year and a half worth of wages. Both um, people, when their debts are forgiven, uh, they're forgiven to about a year and a half's worth of their uh, debt. That's, that's a chunk of change there. Um, if, if ever someone were to come along and say, hey, how about you owe $50,000 less? I would, I would probably welcome that opportunity too. Um, and in this, in this story, um, Jesus is not commending fraud. Um, he's commended the guy's commended for acting um, shrewdly or wisely in light of his situation. His situation is that he's about to lose, lose his job. And he takes a gamble, really. What he does is he says, I've got to get things ready for after I don't have this job 
and I'm going to have to gamble on something. And what he gambles on is the kindness of the master. Is the master, in finding out that some of these debts have been canceled, going to take him to task on it or not? Is he going to have him thrown in prison? Is he going to make him pay these things back? Um, he acted within the realm of, of what is job allowed. He was the money manager for the house. He was the household guy in charge of the treasury. And um, in that, everything was under his care. Uh, similar to the story of Joseph. Um, he gets hired on by Potiphar, and then Potiphar puts him in charge of everything. And this guy's in charge of everything. And then he decides to cancel a bunch of debts. Um, but he gambles on this mercy of God. And, and that's a very good gamble for us to make. If we're going to make any sort of uh, risky Thing in our life. Gambling on the mercy of God is a good, good way to go. Um, but as I, as I kind of um, got into this passage, um, it kind of gave me some, some things that I think will really help us to um, make priorities and make choices. We have to make hard decisions all the time in our life. How do we make these choices in such a way that um, it reflects the goodness and love of God and our opportunities to share it? So, um, I kind of rounded them up in, in P's. This was a hard passage for me to quarter categorize, and so I, I listed off a couple of them, and um, they started with P, and so I ran with it. I'm not normally a Rick Warren, like everything's got to start with the same letter, sort of like organized person, but I'll give you a little bit of organization today. Um, the first thing that, that this um, passage encourages us to do is to, to recognize the situation, perceive your situation clearly. Um, what is the reality of this, this thing that we live in? Um, John chapter 8, 32 says, and you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And that, and that is a very good foundation because if you know what's going on around you, if you see things clearly, if you know where you're at, it gets easier to make the right decisions. Um, when things are really confusing and messy and you're not sure of the truth or uh, if, you, if you don't want to face the truth, it's pretty hard to make good choices. Um, we went to the Oregon coast and in my mind, we're going to a beachfront property I grew up in Southern California. It was generally about 80 degrees. It was a beautiful day every day. And so I began to pack and it was like shorts and t-shirts and a beach blanket so that I could lay out and enjoy some sun and get burned to a crisp. That was my plan uh, for the week. And then Christina, um, she's wise. Um, she decides to look at reality before she packs. And she decided to look up the weather and said, Honey, the high is going to be about 62. <laughs> Are you sure you want those t-shirts and shorts and flip-flops? Um, the truth allows us to be prepared for what we're about to encounter. And there's a few realities that this parable lays out. Um, one of those realities is that um, there is eternal places. That, that there is an after this life thing that's going to happen. Eternal dwellings um, that we could be welcomed into. Um, the other thing is that we're not here forever. Um, the this manager is, a, is, is about to lose his position, and, and our lives are short, man. Um, one of the things that we did while we were at this family gathering is my mom was kind of talking to us about what's going to happen after I go. and um, We were just reminded about a friend who has pancreatic cancer. Like We do not know how long we're going to be here, and even if we are here, what, 40, 50 years? That is a blip. On the, on the extent of eternity. We are not here forever. Um, there's something next. And um, the other one is that Jesus interestingly uses the title of a manager. It comes up in scripture a lot, actually, this idea of us being a manager um, or a steward is the old Christian word. And what it means is that everything we have is a gift. Um, you didn't make it happen. Uh, that's, that's sometimes weird to swallow because we work really hard. We head our lives in a certain direction and we try to acquire things. But the reality is all of our resources, abilities, um, our, our life itself has been given to us by God. Um, and so now that makes us managers of what we have, which is really a beautiful thing. In, in Jesus' day, the manager would be, um, he's not just like a financial manager off in a different place that you hire to like look at your investments or something like that. It was somebody who was living in your house who could be entrusted and um, they got to live off of, enjoy, and, and, um, and manage what they were given. It, it was a beautiful thing. Um, 
It wasn't a stingy sort of thing. It was a, hey, you get to live in my household. I'm going to provide for you. Enjoy yourself. But while you're at it, use these things well for the benefit of the household. Um, so that's what this manager is called to do. And, and he'd been squandering, maybe wasting them on himself. Um, but we are managers. We are given this life. We're given these days. Um, we're given our resources. We're given our talents. And what are we going to do with them? Every day is a gift. We're blessed people. Lately, I've gotten to hang out with Larry Stone a little bit more than usual, and um, one of the things we occasionally get to go do is, is walk the golf course together and, and hit a tiny ball in an incredibly frustrating game. And, um, and as I get frustrated about my shots not working out the way that I envisioned them, I hear Larry over there going, man, what a gift. What a gift. I can't believe I woke up today. I wonder what God asked for me to do today for him. And um, it changes the way we view things when we start to realize that we're blessed people who've been given a lot and everything's a gift. So now what are we going to do with it? Um, which kind of leads me to the second, second piece of this. Um, after we perceive the reality that we're not here forever, that what we have is a gift, um, then we begin to have to prioritize what it is we're going to do. What will you invest your time, your resources, your talents in? Um, and will it fulfill you and will it get us where we need to go um, this week um, while we were sitting around on the coast we were talking about um, what kind of stuff do we hope for in life where do we want to be and my brother was talking about how after his kids go off to college he, he would love to go out to um, Lake Chelan just buy a place on the shore of Lake Chelan and enjoy it there and um, <coughs> And I found myself wondering, if he got his place in Chelan, would he really be happy there? Um, I don't know if it would change anything. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, I don't know if it would change anything. And as I thought about my own life and the stuff that I go through, I spend an awful lot of time and energy and stress and worry, worrying about things that um, I don't know how much, in the end, a difference they'll make. It's not that they're not important. It's not that they're not worth handling well. Um, but I get stressed and I get worried and I get anxious about lots of things that don't end up impacting me long term or end up impacting other people in eternity. Um, I used to do youth ministry, worked with high schoolers, and I would get to walk along them and hear about what was going on in their life. And uh, I remember um, very early on, um, ran across this, this girl in my high school group who was like 15 and, and she could talk forever. Man, it was like three hour conversations and I'm just hanging on there. But one of the <laughs> constant conversations was, um, I just met this guy and we were, we've been dating like three weeks now and I'm pretty <laughs> sure he's the one. And we just broke up. And it was like the entire world just <laughs> fell apart. And, um, and I remember wishing that, she, I wish she could see a little bit further down the road than she is now. And I don't know how to make someone able to see it, but I feel like that's kind of what Jesus is doing, is going, look a little further than you can right now, because you can make some choices right here and now that are going to impact down the road. And some of the stuff you're so worried about right now won't stick around. Um, what would it look like if we started making choices based on things that last and started seeking things um, that would impact eternity? What's going to be in eternity? Your money will not be with you in eternity. Um, can't take it with you, they say. Um, I guess our talents will still be there. We'll still be doing stuff in eternity. Um, but, the, but the piles of stuff we build up, it won't be there. But what will be there is people. Um, people will be there. And that's, that's what Jesus actually says in this parable. He says that this guy cut people's debts um, so that there were people that would welcome him into their home. And then he says, do this likewise. Like, use your money 
so that there are people who welcome you into your eternal dwelling. Um, a couple weeks ago we had a housewarming and many of you came out to my house. It was such an incredible gift and there was a shift, um, at least for me and my perception of our house. We had a nice house, um, but it was just a house. It was a, a bunch of concrete and wood and stuff like that. It was, it was great. But um, once you all came and filled it up, then it was something. It was housewarming. Literally felt like the house got warmed and now it was a place for people. Um, that's the stuff that matters. What if we spent our life investing in seeing people impacted well for a long time? I think that's what he's inviting us to, which kind of leads me to the next thing, which is um, play the long game, not the short game. And it's not golf. Golf, the long game, is hitting woods or whatever. But in investing or in politics or something, it's, it's long-term strategy. I grew up playing chess with my dad. My dad taught me how to play chess. And, um, and he beat me every time we played until I was about 15. Um, and it wasn't cruel, it was just I had to rise to a certain level if I was going to beat him and he wasn't going to throw a game uh, to make that happen. But, but I remember that when I finally got to the point where I could beat him, it, it involved recognizing that the end goal was getting his king, not just trading pieces on the board. Had to focus on the end goal. And um, in investing, people do this too. Uh, at one point, Christina and I tried to like talk to this guy my mom suggested for our retirement. Now, I feel like I'm forever away from retirement. Um, but we went and talked to this guy, and he goes, well, you're a long ways off, but if this is where you want to get to, here's what you need to do now. Um, it was a really helpful perspective, and I feel like Jesus is kind of pushing us to do this, to say, what would it look like to focus on where you're going to be in eternity rather than right now? Um, and when we do that, we begin to take short little losses where we go, oh, this is going to cost me some time. This might cost me a little bit of my resources. This is something that I can do. Um, but if I do it, somebody's going to be blessed. So it might make it worth doing. Um, Christina and I experienced this in a profound way. Um, it's really the, the start of where hospitality became a passion for us. We were driving down I-5. I might have told you this story before. We stopped for gas in Fireball, California. It is um, outside of, I don't know, Sacramento by a good hour. It's, it's in the middle of nowhere. Um, and nearby is a little farming town called Clovis. And um, we got out, we filled up our car with gas. We got back in, we put the key in the ignition, and it wouldn't turn. The tumblers in the ignition lock had fallen apart. This car was not going to start at all. We were um, young kids. We knew not what to do. So Christina called her mom, who had grown up in Sacramento, and said, do you know anybody nearby that might be able to help us out or anything? And, and she said, well, I have a high school boyfriend. <laughs> that I used to date who lives in Clovis. Now they hadn't talked in, in who knows how many years. So she um, called this guy and he was in the middle of having dinner with some friends and he left his dinner, drove over, picked us up, brought us back to dinner with him and uh, had us stay at his house while they looked at our car. Well, then they called us back and said, um, yeah, it's, it's a Volvo. Those locks got to be specially ordered. It's going to be five days that you're in Clovis, California. And um, we didn't know what to do, but this guy goes, oh, no, no, no. Just, just stay with me. For five days, Christina and I were treated as family by a guy that her mom had dated 15 years ago. Um, we literally went to family dinners with them. It was, it was incredible. Um, and we knew at that point that that was the sort of people we wanted to be later on. Um, it planted a seed of hospitality in us that, um, that had an impact and has impacted a number of other people since. And the ripples will keep going out. Um, most acts of generosity and grace, where you don't expect anything back, but you just do it, because it needs to get done and it shows the love of God to somebody, creates an opening for God to do something really, really cool and really beautiful and really restorative in people's lives. Um, now, um, 
that grace that we can show to others, we also have to show it to ourselves. Um, it comes in the territory. Like this manager, we may have made mistakes. Um, this guy squandered a lot. He was about to lose his job. Um, but then he makes this gamble on the grace of the master by cutting people's debts. And, um, and then he's commended for it. It's a strange, strange parable, but, but it fits when you start to realize that we have a God who forgives and shows grace and wants to see people impacted by generosity and love. All of that fits very beautifully. Um, which kind of brings me to the next piece, which is your permanent um, blessings can be made out of resources that are passing. Um, we have a bunch of stuff that's not going to last. It's temporary. Um, but something that can, can last can be made of it. Um, I want to read for you. Verse 8 again. It says, um, The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the people in this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than other people of the light. Um, he acted shrewdly. Um, he was commended. And that seems weird. Why was he commended? I mean, he, he canceled a bunch of people's debts. Um, he was already running for his life. He's kind of acting frantically um, and maybe not doing the most right thing, but why was he commended? He was commended for shrewdness, for prudence, for skillfully seeing his situation and acting within it. Um, and then something occurred to me. This guy had a ridiculous amount of debt over these people. Um, God's resources are not lacking. He doesn't need the money. He doesn't need the abundance. He's already got that. Maybe he was commended also for the fact that he finally quit squandering stuff on himself and used it to bless some other people. Maybe he's commended because now the relationship with those other people who were owed is going to be better because they can see that there's some grace there. It doesn't compute in our financial brains because that's how we think about it. You have an edge, you take it, you get as much as you can when you can get it. What if God has a totally different way of doing things, which is when you see an opportunity to bless, you bless even though it's going to cost you. Because in the process, eternity gets impacted. Um, there is a kingdom value of generosity over stinginess. We have a God who left heaven, became a man, and then gave everything. His entire life, he, he spent what was temporary so that we could have a way into eternity with him. Um, that is the pattern. <clears throat> Generous, forgiving lives open a door for God to do amazing things. Um, one of my favorite um, people with this regard is a guy by the name of Jim Elliott. You may have heard of him before, but he was a missionary to um, a tribe in Ecuador. Um, and everybody told him, don't go, this is idiot. Like, you're an idiot to go to this dangerous tribe. They, um, you're risking your life by doing this. And he was like, no, I've got to share the gospel with them because they need to know the love of God so that they can spend eternity with him. Um, and he wrote a lot about why he did what he did. Um, and one of the things that he wrote was this, and I'm going to read it twice so that we can catch it. He said, He's no fool that gives what he can't keep to gain that which he can't lose. I'm going to read it again. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Um, he did die, actually, while sharing the gospel with these people. Um, but to him it made sense because he gave what he couldn't keep. He was not going to live forever anyway. But they gained what they couldn't lose, which is eternity with God in heaven. There will be people in eternal dwellings welcoming Jim Elliot when, when he passed away into heaven because he gave what he could when he could. I feel like I've lost that urgency sometimes. I have this invulnerable sense that I'm going to be here forever and that I can always do it tomorrow. 
and that I have a lot and that most of it's probably for me. Uh, what if we shift that in our brains and think, I don't know what tomorrow brings. I don't know how many days I have, but I have an opportunity. What if we could bless some people for eternity in it? No. Temporary treasures can get moved into permanent blessings when we do it. Mm, so what? What are we going to do with this? Um, Jesus' point in saying that the people of this world um, are smarter than, uh, we, than the children of the light. Um, he, he tells the story of an immoral, unscrupulous, irresponsible person going and making a deal with a bunch of people who owe the master a debt. Um, and then they're unscrupulous too. They're like, oh, you're desperate. I can, I can use that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut. You're going to cut my debt? Sure. Absolutely. Cut it down. And then I'll let you stay at my house later. Um, and this guy's like, well, I have a chance to, to cut a bunch of my master's debt off, to, to have a place to live. Um, but what they do is they seize their moments. What they don't understand that the children of the light do is that there is an eternity at hand. And if those two get combined, if we recognize that our time and our talent and our treasures are going to pass away, that there's an eternity that we can live for, and we seize the moment. In the business world, if you get an edge, you grab it, better take it, because it's not going to be there forever. Um, our opportunities to impact people's lives will not be there forever. I can't think of how many times I've had the opportunity to say something or do something, and then I thought, I'm a little nervous of what they'll think of me. Or maybe I'll do that next week when I have more time. Or those opportunities, they, they vanished. New ones came up, which is great. Thanks for the goodness of God and His grace and His forgiveness and fresh starts every day. But what if we seize the moments just like business people did to make the most of them, except we did it to impact eternity and show God's love to people? That's a recipe for a pretty fun life, I think. Um, Jesus is saying, seize this day. Seize this week for eternity. Bless some people. Live generously. Show the love of God in ways that are not expected and be amazed at what happens. Is that something that we could do? I think so. Let's pray. God, thank you for all that we have. Um, it's hard for us to wrap our head around that. Um, but you give us a lot. We've been blessed. And, and you give us day after day. And help us to be people who seize moments to bless people, to care for people, to build people up, to um, do what we can to help somebody else down the road a little bit. Um, and in doing so, Lord, I pray that you would become more clear to us and clear to them and that we could somehow grasp how big your love is, how great your love is, um, and how you gave yourself for us. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen.